To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Before we move ahead, let us quickly summarize whatever we have learned in lesser accounting, sub leases and sale and leaseback transactions, right? Uh, this is one standard which is very lengthy. So we have to do this, you know, quick summaries in between so that you don't lose a track of whatever we have learned. Now, as far as lesser accounting is concerned, lesser has to classify the leases as finance leases or operating leases. What is finance lease? Finance lease is a lease where the lease transfers substantially all the risks and rewards incidental to ownership, right? So when the transfer happens, it is a finance lease. If those risks and rewards are not transferred, then it is an operating lease. Now, there are some examples given. Uh, generally, the first five examples that we understood are more relevant from examination purpose. That is, if there is a transfer of property at the end of the lease term, then it is a finance lease. Or if there is a bargain purchase option, that is to say, there is a purchase option and it is reasonably certain that the lessee will exercise that purchase option. In that case, also we call it to be a finance lease. Then if the lease is for a major part of the economic useful life of that underlying asset, then also we classify it as a finance lease. Or if the present value of lease payments is substantially all of the fair value of the underlying asset, then in that case also we classify it to be a finance lease. And lastly, if it is a specialized asset and only the lessee can use it and if anybody else has to use it, then we need to do substantial modifications. In such cases also it is called to be a finance lease. See, uh, you have to look at these conditions and also other examples which are given. And with a combined reading and with a combined understanding of the circumstances, you have to figure out whether substantially all the risk and rewards incidental to ownership of the asset has been transferred. If yes, then it is a finance lease. Otherwise, it is an operating lease. Now, as far as finance lease is concerned, in the books of Lesar, if you have to account for a finance lease, what would you do? You would recognize something called a net investment in lease and de-recognize the underlying asset, the difference being debited or credited to PNL. Now, what is this net investment in lease? Net investment in lease is the present value of gross investment in lease at interest rate implicit in the lease. Now, we have, we have put three terms here. What is gross investment in lease? Gross investment in lease is sum of your lease payments, if you look at it from the point of view of the lessee, plus any other guaranteed residual value that you get from third party, plus the unguaranteed residual value, all of these three put together, you get gross investment in lease. When you discount this gross investment in lease, using the implicit rate in the lease, what you get is net investment in lease. Now, as far as implicit rate is concerned, for manufacturer and dealer lessor, you do not consider the initial direct cost to calculate the implicit rate. In other cases, you do consider the initial direct cost to calculate the implicit rate. Then we spoke about accounting in the books of manufacturer or dealer lessor. Now, whenever you talk about manufacturer or dealer lessor, they are the ones who would be normally selling an asset, but they give an option to the customer that they can take it on lease as well. So when you talk about a manufacturer and a seller lessor, manufacturer or a dealer lessor, then there is this concept of recognizing revenue as well as selling profit. What is revenue? Revenue is equal to the lower of fair value of the underlying asset or present value of the lease rentals discounted at market interest rates, right? So the lower of these two will be recognized as revenue. Then you will recognize cost of goods sold. What is the cost of goods sold? Cost of goods sold is the carrying amount of the underlying asset less the present value of unguaranteed residual value. This gives you the cost of goods sold. Difference will be accounted as profit. So when it is a case of a manufacturer or a dealer lessor, the manufacturer or dealer lessor will have to account for revenue as well as account for the profits. Then we understood about subsequent measurement in the books of lessor, right? So in, the subse in case of subsequent measurement, the lessor would recognize interest income. So this interest income is added to your lease receivable or the net investment in lease and the payment that is received from the lessee that is reduced from the net investment in lease and we will carry out an impairment testing then we'll check for impairment losses, if any, for net investment in lease. Now, because these are financial assets, you'll apply the principles given under NDS 109 for testing for impairment. So we took an example of residual value changes. And whenever the residual value changed, then the value of net investment in lease had come down and the difference was recognized in PNL. Now, this re this remeasurement is done at the original rate of interest. You will not revise the discount rate. You will check the you will take the same discount rate to account for changes due to residual values. 
right so that is one more thing which you need to understand then we also understood about how do we account for operating leases pretty simple and straightforward in case of operating leases lease income is recognized on a straight line basis or any other systematic basis over the lease term as simple as that there is no complication right and when we talk about operating leases if there are initial direct cost then they are not immediately expensed they are added to the carrying amount of the underlying asset and they are expensed in similar lines as we recognize lease income then we spoke about lease modification whenever there is a lease modification we reassess the classification please remember classification of operating lease and finance lease is done at the inception after that you do not reassess the classification unless there is a lease modification right so whenever there is a lease modification that is increase in the scope of lease reduction in scope of lease change in consideration which were not a part of the original terms and conditions then we call it a lease modification in case of a lease modification you need to first check whether there is an increase in scope by adding one or more right of use asset and whether the increased consideration is commensurate with the standalone price of increase in scope. If that condition is satisfied, you will account for the lease modification as a separate lease. So separately, you will assess whether it is an operating lease, finance lease and accordingly do the accounting. If that is not the case, means if there is no separate accounting, then you will have to check the lease modification. And if the lease modification is not a separate lease, then you have to check whether the lease would have been classified as an operating lease if the revised terms and conditions were applied at the inception of the lease. So basically, if the lease modification is not to be accounted for as a separate lease, then you would see whether the lease modification results in reclassification from a finance lease to an operating lease. And how will you check this? You will check this by applying the revised terms and conditions since inception, right? So if you had applied the revised terms and conditions at the inception of the lease, then would that lease be classified as an operating lease? If that is the case, then what would you do? You would de-recognize the net investment in these and you will recognize the underlying asset at the carrying amount of net investment in these. So basically, net investment in lease will go out of the books and the asset will come back from the books. Okay, So that would happen if a finance lease is modified into an operating lease. But if the finance lease after lease modification continues to remain a finance lease, then you will remeasure the net investment in lease by applying the principles given under in days 109, right? That, that is with respect to lease modifications for a finance lease. If it is a lease modification of an operating lease, then the modified lease is treated as a new lease and you will account for the new lease accordingly. So the new lease may be a finance lease, it may be an operating lease, accordingly you will account for the new lease. Then we spoke about subleases. What is a sublease? Sublease is basically a lease between the original lessee and a third party. So there is a lessor, there is a lessee. This lessor and lessee have entered into a lease, a lease arrangement. Then what the lessee does is lessee gives that particular asset on lease to another party, which is the third party. The original lessor is called the head lessor. The original lease between the head lessor and the original lessee is called the head lease. And the lease contract between the lessee that is the original lessee and the third party now the original lessee becomes a lessor we call him intermediate lessor or a sub lessor and the third party is a sub lessee the arrangement between these two is called a sub lease now the question is how do we account for sub lease now when we say accounting for sub lease we are talking about accounting in the books of the intermediate lessor or the sub lessor because the original lessor will account for as if it is a normal lease even for the sub lessee it is a normal lease transaction it doesn't make it complicated for sub lessor or the intermediate lessor is where the accounting becomes slightly complicated now what the sub lessor has to do is he has to classify the lease as an operating lease or a finance lease now if the original lease is a short term lease then compulsorily the intermediate lessor will classify it as an operating lease otherwise the intermediate lessor will apply the principles of whether substantial risk and rewards incidental to ownership have been transferred those five conditions and other examples that we spoke about with reference to the right of use asset and classify the lease as a finance lease or an operating lease if the classification results in a finance lease then the intermediate lessor will recognize a net investment in lease and de-recognize the right of use asset. Okay, And he will continue to show the original lease liability which he has towards the head lessor. That is in case of a finance lease. In case of an operating lease, recognize the lease income on a straight line basis. And there may be indications of impairment, then the intermediate lessor also needs to check for 
indicators of impairment whether the net investment in lease has been impaired or whether the original right of use asset has been impaired in case it is a, in case the sublease is an operating lease basically if the lease rentals expected are less than the right of use asset then definitely there is an indication that there is an impairment so accordingly in days 36 should be applied and the asset should be impaired then we spoke about sale and leaseback transactions. So we have a seller, we have a buyer. Seller sells an underlying asset to the buyer. Buyer leases back that asset to the seller. So seller also becomes the lessee, buyer also becomes the lesser. Now in such a case, how do we account for the transaction? What index 116 requires is check as per index 115 whether the performance obligation are met, whether the control of the asset is transferred by the seller to the buyer. If the answer is yes, if it is, if it can be recognized as a sale, then the seller will recognize sale, the seller will de-recognize the underlying asset and the buyer will recognize the purchase and buyer will, buyer will recognize the purchase and buyer will account for the asset purchased as per relevant standard, right? So if the sale criteria is met, seller will account for a sale and the buyer will also account for the purchase. And because there is a follow-up leaseback transaction, then the buyer becomes a lesser and he will do the lesser accounting. The seller will do the lessee accounting. So when the seller lessee does the lessee accounting, he'll basically recognize a right of use asset and a lease liability. Now, as far as this right of use asset recognition is concerned, it has to be based on the carrying amount of the original asset and the right of use asset will be restricted to the proportion of the right which are retained in the sale and leaseback transaction right so the right of use asset will not be measured as lease liability plus plus it will not be done in that way the right of use asset will be measured based on the carrying amount and the proportion of the right of use retained by the seller let's see okay accordingly the profit that is recognized will also be restricted to the right which are transferred to the buyer so for the portion of the rights which are retained the seller lessee will not recognize any profit okay so that is how the accounting would be done in case of a sale and a leaseback transaction uh, the other thing that you need to understand in case of a sale and leaseback transaction is if the sale and leaseback transaction are not at market terms meaning to say the selling prices may be different from the fair value of the underlying asset or the lease rent, present value of lease rentals are different from the present value of market rentals in that case we say that the sale has not happened at market terms if the sale has not happened at market terms then if the sale is above the market terms which means the buyer has paid extra the lessee is paying extra rental that difference whatever is excess paid is recognized as a financing liability and in other case if the sale and leaseback transaction is below the market terms in that case the seller lessee will consider the short payment from the buyer as a prepayment of lease payments right so that is how the accounting has to be done if at all the sale and leaseback transaction is not at market terms then you will make that adjustment if it is above the market terms there will be an additional financing which is recognized by the seller lessee and the buyer lessor if it is below the market terms then the difference is treated as a lease prepayment, right? This is how the sale and leaseback accounting is done. Now, one thing that you need to keep in mind is just because there is a sale transaction and followed by a leaseback transaction and maybe the position has not been transferred, that does not mean that the sale has not been concluded. So, if the sale conclusion criteria is met as given under India 115, then the lessee will account for a sale transaction and seller will account for a sale transaction and the buyer will account for a purchase transaction. Then the lessee will account for the lease transaction, ROU, right of use asset and a lease liability. The lessor will also account for the lease transaction accordingly. So just because the lessee gets back the right to use an asset does not mean that the sale has not happened. Okay. Few things that you need to keep in mind here is that if the lease back is a finance lease, then the substantial risk and rewards incidental to ownership are again transferred back to the lessee and in that case we consider it to be a failed sale transaction and in that case what is done in that case it is treated as a financial liability by the lessee and a financial asset by lsr as per india's 109 okay if there is a repurchase option which the seller is likely to exercise even in that case we say that the control has not been transferred and it is a failed sale transaction so wherever there is a failed sale transaction in that case you will consider it to be a financial liability and a financial asset. So that is about the sale and leaseback transaction. We did a detailed problem in understanding how to calculate the right of use asset, how to calculate the profit and how do we account for these transactions in the books of the lessee and the lessor, right? Having understood this, let us now move on to a few other aspects which are left out in the standard. One, to deal with the scope of the standard and then the transitionary provisions.